Yesterday we talked about simplicity and St. Therese, especially in prayer, how she approached her prayer life in a simple way. Today we're going to look at a couple of other things that she talked about regarding simplicity. First of all, simplicity in her actions and also in the practice of renunciation and penance. Therese's way focuses, as we said yesterday, mostly on actions that are ordinary and that are commonplace. So her focus is on things that other people won't be envious of if we're doing them. Sometimes we see other people doing great things and we're envious of what they do. That's not so much St. Therese's focus. Uh, we do, as we mentioned yesterday in yesterday's conference, we do give God the liberty to act in extraordinary ways in our lives. If he wants to do that, he's God. He has the liberty to choose to do that if he wants to. St. Therese also would have given him the same liberty as well, the same freedom. But again, the extraordinary or sensational things weren't so much her focus in the spiritual life. Uh, when you read the biographies of some saints, like if you read St. Veronica, Giuliani or St. Pio, the two Franciscan Capuchin stigmatists, right? If you read their biographies, it seems like everything is extraordinary, one thing after another. Um, probably in real life that wasn't the case, but if you have a biography of someone, you're writing this much about their life, you kind of, what do you do? You write about the highlights, typically. What are the things that are stand out? Uh, it wasn't the case with St. Therese. Well, you know, her biographies don't have lists of extraordinary miracles or extraordinary graces and I think that was also one of the her complaints about the lives of the saints too. She would read them and she would uh, say that they were a bit over the top in the sense that they weren't something that was accessible to everyone and she would also would have uh, I think she said she would also have liked to see in the biographies of the saints some of their defects too. Let's read about some of the defects of the saints because the saints did have defects. She considered herself a very little soul, as she said, one who can only offer insignificant things to God. And she said, God has no need for brilliant deeds, for beautiful thoughts. It is neither intelligence nor talent he's looking for on earth. He loves simplicity. She said, we would indeed deserve pity if we were requi required to do great things. So we would be very among the most to be pitied if we were required to do great things. Uh, so that's important to keep in mind that with the idea that God looks for love in everything. Not so much talent or intelligence or wealth or capabilities or external ability uh, he's, uh, or beauty. He's looking for someone to love him. Essentially he's looking for, it's like what we do, right? We look for people to love us. That's exactly what God is looking for in life as well. He's looking for someone to love him. Some people are capable of doing great deeds and that's a good thing, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, however, St. Therese would say that greatness in God's eyes generally comes how? how? What is greatness in God's eyes like? It's generally doing ordinary things with love. Even with great love for God. And that was uh, Mother Teresa's, that was what she would say often, right? Do, it, do little things with great love. Her patron was St. Therese. She actually took her name for St. Therese. And they would ask Mother Teresa, well, who are you named after? She'd say, the little, the little Teresa, not the big one. <laughs> so the big one is St. Teresa of Avila. She said, no, I'm, I'm named after the little one. On a side note, it's kind of, in general speaking, as far as our life of prayer goes, and, and that it's typically the depth of our union with God that counts the most. Um, I remember someone recently asking me, they said, Father, you know, if I'm in prayer and I am I in church and I'm kneeling down and I'm praying, you know, I'm really praying focused uh, uh, there and or if I'm out in the field and kind of, uh, kind of uh, feeding the cattle or I'm raking the leaves or something, where, where do I give the greatest glory to God uh, when I'm, when, what kind of prayer do I do that? And I stopped and I thought for a second, I said, well, it really depends on the intensity of our union with God. You know, the intensity of your union with God, it shows where you give the greatest uh, glory to Him in prayer, how much grace you give to Him, or how much grace you receive from Him. Yes? Father, when you speak of union with God, does that mean that your will is synonymous with His, your union as well? That would be uh, certainly the highest union when your will is perfectly conformed mm -hmm. 
to his will. That would be the highest union of God. So in those three levels of the spiritual life, that would be the highest level when you're perfectly conformed. So someone who is at the highest level of the spiritual life, uh, the little things that they do are done in total union with God, and so they're more meritorious. There's more grace in that. It doesn't mean that you have to be in the church praying all the time to actually be united to the Lord. So how strong, how intimate your relationship is with the Lord, that depends on how uh, powerful your prayers are, how powerful your your intercession is for others. So sanctity is not based on external circumstances. It's very important to keep in mind. Sanctity is not based on external circumstances. It's based on the internal working of the Holy Spirit in us, in our minds and in our hearts. God's grace working in us in our cooperation with that grace. When we do what our Lord says, when we Love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, with all our mind, as he says in Luke 10, 27, when we do that and love our neighbors as ourselves, that's greatness in God's eyes. That really is when our prayers become very powerful to him. Again, quoting from St. Therese, she said, I don't despise profound thoughts which nourish the soul and unite us to God, but I have understood for a long time that we do not need to build on such foundations, nor does perfection consist in receiving many lights. The most sublime thoughts are valueless without works, she says. The most beautiful thoughts, if they don't have works attached to them, they're not worth anything. It sounds very similar to what St. James said in the New Testament, which Martin Luther didn't like, right? Uh, that's, this is the book he wanted to get rid of in the New Testament. He actually wanted to cancel it. Uh, St. James says, faith without works is dead. It's dead, right? It's dead. James 2.20. Also, St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13.2, he says, if I have the gift of prophecy and com comprehend all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith so as to move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing, he says. I'm nothing, right? St. Therese would say, God made me realize that in order to attain true glory, we do not have to accomplish brilliant works but we must hide ourselves and practice virtue in such a way that our left hand doesn't know what our right hand does. Where does that come from? Where does that saying come from? Does anyone, does that sound familiar to anyone? It comes from the scriptures. That's what Jesus himself said. Uh, he said, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, Matthew 6, 3. Who understands what that means? Can anyone actually give an explanation? What does that mean? That's right, yeah, Sermon on the Mount, uh-huh, exactly. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have any idea, what is, how do you understand that? Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. I will ask Paul if no one raises their hand, because I mean, he's just, he's very, he's very humble, he just, he, he already knows, but. Uh, it's just yeah. like uh, leading a holy life. Leading a holy life. So, yeah, which means virtue. Mm-hmm. So it's just part of your nature. So that, so that this hand doesn't know what this hand is doing. Probably that would be the context of uh, where, where Jesus is saying it, yeah. And if you're so focused on God, you don't care what you do. You don't. You, you, to be so focused on God so that you don't, you don't know that it's divine providence even that's carrying you along. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I agree. I would agree. That's exactly what I was going to say. It's your total focus is on God, not on yourself. Okay. Census fidelium, so that if we're to agree, then uh, the answer. So I say, yeah, it means obviously not doing good and not telling others. So don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Doing good, not telling others, also could mean uh, not even really reflecting on the good deeds that we do, just doing them. Is that what you said? Okay, that's what you said. Uh, you know, basically where it becomes second nature. 
You know, something becomes second nature, you do it without even thinking about it, essentially. Uh, even when you're driving sometimes, you know, how to sometimes to get to work or to get home. You just drive, you know how to get there, you don't even really have to think about what you're doing. You just know where to turn and it just becomes a second nature type of thing. It becomes habitual. Okay, yeah, I think that's a big, and that's one of the things that I'll mention here is that uh, in short, you know, not letting your left hand know what your right hand is doing is a way of saying that we forget ourselves in a certain sense. We actually uh, forget ourselves, self-forgetfulness in doing good. So what's the opposite of self-focus? Self-forgetfulness, that's the opposite. We shouldn't do good so that others will notice us or thank us for it. We should do good spontaneously like Jesus did. We should do good so that our Heavenly Father will notice us. If you want someone to notice you, do it for the Heavenly Father. Do it for the Lord. St. Therese did everything simply to please Jesus. She made acts of virtue and renunciations as circumstances dictated. So depending on what was going on, she would know the best way to respond. And she offered to God the little nothings which alone remain to a soul that lives in spiritual dryness. So she was a very often, for most of her life, she was in what we call spiritual dryness. What does that mean? No real consolations from the Lord, no real great inspirations or lights uh, going through and being faithful to what she had to do each day. Like walking through the desert with the Israelites. You know, that's spiritual dryness. It's a great image from the Old Testament, walking to the promised land, but through the desert. St. Therese wrote this, she wrote, I have no other way to prove my love than to strew flowers. That is, to use every opportunity for making little sacrifices, be they a look or a word. To use all the most insignificant things and do them out of love. Hence, I pluck every flower I find on my way for Jesus. And then as I strew my flowers, meaning her little sacrifices, before him, I desire to sing, although I have had to pluck them among the thorns. And the sharper and longer the thorns, the sweeter is my song. So I don't know if, if this was a retreat for all men. I don't know how well this would be received by uh, a lot of, this isn't, this is something where men would hear this and a lot of times they say, well, this doesn't make sense. Flowers and picking flowers and uh, you've got to understand what she's talking about. She's basically talking about, you know, I'm offering up everything as a sacrifice to the Lord uh, and there are thorns among the sacrifices and it's actually, so it's very flowery, poetic language, but it's really underneath of it, she's a, a, as, as tough as steel, really, when you think about it. When you think about what she's talking about, how she's living, it's actually very difficult to do that. It requires a high level of perfection. She's not afraid of suffering or sacrifices for her or Lord. So I have a note here that if we're not so sure, sometimes we aren't so sure we hear sacrifices, you should make sacrifices. Sometimes we don't even know, what do I, what, how should I do that? How do I go about doing that? What, is, what, what would be a good th sacrifice for me to do? Uh, my suggestion would be ask the Lord first thing. You know, what, what kind of sacrifices can I make, Lord? Uh, if you're not sure, ask him. He'll let you know one way or another. He'll make it... He'll make it clear to you one way or another. If you do know what kind of sacrifices you should make to him, I would still say ask him anyway. Why? Because he likes it when we ask him things, right? Our Lord likes it when we go to him and we bring things to him. That's actually uh, basically cultivating a relationship with him. That way he feels a part of our life too. I think sometimes the Lord doesn't feel that he's really a part of our life because we don't allow him to be. We should go to him and share with him. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me. Does anyone know that Bible verse when Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, what must they do? Pick up your cross. Deny yourself. Pick, pick up your cross and follow me, right? Um, Luke 9, 23. First thing, deny yourself, Jesus said. 
And that verse is actually uh, in that book that I showed you yesterday by Tanqueray, by uh, the spiritual life. He gives a little introduction in the beginning, and he's talking about the three ways of the spiritual life. He said that verse, uh, some, some writers have actually seen that verse as a summary of the spiritual life. So uh, if anyone would follow after me, they won't deny themselves. So that's the first stage, the purgative stage. So that means you learn to say no to sin, turn away from sin. You learn to turn to God. Second part, take up your cross daily. Uh, they would say that's the illuminative stage. That's when we begin to imitate Jesus in his virtues. We begin to take up our cross like he did. And then follow me, they would say that's the unitive stage. When it's really the, the will of God, when it's the Holy Spirit who's guiding us. So you can see the whole spiritual life just in, the, in a nutshell in that one verse. Talking about little renunciation, St. Therese said this, would religious life be meritorious without these sacrifices? No, on the contrary, these small crosses constitute all our joy. They are commonplace, but they prepare our hearts to accept the great crosses when such is the will of our good master, when God wills to give us greater crosses. So the smaller crosses are what prepare us for the bigger ones. Does anyone know of a Bible verse where this, this might sound like Jesus said something regarding this matter? Does anyone, does this ring a bell to anyone? Uh, where does Jesus say, you know, he talks about small things and then big things. Exactly what I have, exactly, I have it written down here, right? Luke 16, 10. He says, he who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. He who is dishonest in very little is dishonest also in much. Right? Very good. So we need to remember always that crosses are sanctifying. Crosses are what help conform us to Jesus. We have to remember that. Exactly. That's right. That's right. Crosses are the kiss of Jesus. That's basically the opposite of what we would think naturally, right? We would think, okay, uh, you know, well-being and uh, material comfort and uh, everything is fine. That's a sign of blessing. Even the Old Testament for the Israelites, that was often, that was a sign of blessing. You know, everything is going well in your life. Uh, that is a sign that God is blessing you. Uh, our Lord says it's not always the case. Where there are crosses, there's Jesus. Where there's Jesus, there's Mary. So our Lord wants us to think along those lines. To go back to something that we mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, often we may neglect or underestimate the little sacrifices and the small, ordinary acts of daily virtue. We hold important works in esteem. So the big things we hold in esteem. And we admire the big and grandiose tasks. And Father Jamar says, by this somewhat artificial standard of values, he says. So esteeming the great things and despising the little things. He says, by this somewhat artificial standard of values, spiritually we lose much and we show but little love, he says. Nothing is insignificant or negligible in the service of God. The value of an action comes from two things. What's the value of it come from in the spiritual life? One, the intention. Two, the love that we put into it. The intention and the love that we put into it that animates our actions. Little things done out of love, says St. Therese, are those that charm the heart of Christ. On the contrary, what we just said a minute ago, the most brilliant things done without love are spiritually empty. They're not worth anything in God's sight. They're spiritually empty. It is true that sometimes we have greater works to do and there is more difficulty in doing them, and so persevering in that, sometimes there is greater merit in that. It's a greater work of love because it requires a greater degree of renunciation. So greater renunciation can mean greater merit. Nevertheless, the true value of actions springs from the quality of love that animates them. So I think what you're getting a picture of here with St. Therese, uh, as far as her teaching, she's teaching that the little way is 
about sanctifying our ordinary life, sanctifying our day-to-day life, renouncing ourselves in little things, renouncing our wills, practicing the ordinary virtues, patience, kindness, gentleness, thoughtfulness, simple things. I mentioned before about St. Therese's uh, critique of some of the lives of the saints. Uh, you know, part of the critique was that the lives are filled with extraordinary things, so things that really aren't accessible to a lot of people. Some people they are, but not everyone. So it makes holiness seem impossible sometimes when you read the lives of the saints. The little way stresses that holiness is for everyone, and it can be achieved through being faithful to the normal, ordinary duties of everyday life. And we know it's not a small thing when you think about it. It's not a small thing to be virtuous and to remain faithful every day to the things that you have to do every day, to practice virtue in all the little things. That's actually not as small as we might think it is. Sometimes that requires a lot of perseverance and a lot of strength on our part to be able to do that, especially if it's live day to day if we have a dryness of soul so we don't have a lot of fervor for love of God or others in our heart if we have a dryness of soul to be, to be uh, continuing and persevering in doing good without a lot of spiritual consolations or illuminations that's a great path of sanctity The image that always comes to mind whenever I think of that is the Israelites in the desert, right? 40 years in the desert, wandering in the desert. When are we going to get there? When are we going to get there? The Lord, the whole time, is trying to get them to learn to be detached from the old way of life, detached from their way of thinking, detached from their wills, learning to attach themselves to God. That was the whole training ground. Why did it take 40 years to get there? Because that's, they needed that much training, you know? They need that. It could have been a couple weeks, actually. Uh, if, uh, if they were spiritually prepared, they could have gotten there in a couple weeks. Uh, the Lord said, no, we'll do 40 years. <laughs> Sometimes we don't even feel like we have anything to offer the Lord, right? Sometimes we don't feel like we have anything to offer. What did St. Therese say about that? She said, if I felt like I had nothing to offer to Jesus, I would offer him that nothing. <laughs> I don't have anything to offer, so I offer you the nothing that I have to offer. Can it all be considered sacrifice? Sure. St. Paul says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. So not just our bodies, but interiorly as well. Interiorly as well. Your soul is attached to your body, so if you offer the one. Essentially, love uh, in this world, love is uh, measured by sacrifice, essentially. The little nothings that we offer to Jesus, the insignificant acts of, and sacrifices faithfully made are, according to St. Therese, a true martyrdom. She considered that a true martyrdom. But of course, St. Therese's life wasn't all ordinary, so we talk about all the ordinary stuff. It wasn't all ordinary. Does anyone remember anything extraordinary that happened in St. Therese's life? Anyone who knows of St. Therese or who knows about her story? Okay, exactly. Mm -hmm. Right, when she was, I don't remember how old she was. Was she nine or ten? And uh, she was d deathly ill, basically. And they had a bunch of masses said for her. And uh, one of the, during the novena of masses, Our, Our Lady smiled, the statue smiled at, at uh, Therese, and she was healed instantly. That's extraordinary. Does anyone know of anything else that happened in her life that was a, kind of extraordinary or out of the ordinary? Can anyone think of anything else? Wow, okay. Okay, 
Yeah, so she was, she was pretty busy. She's been pretty busy after her life. Uh, once, uh, once she passed on, she's been, she kept pretty busy after that. She was canonized in 1925. I think St. John Vianney was canonized the same year, I think, if I'm not mistaken. So as far as other things in her life, I remember the Christmas miracle that you probably heard about that story when she was 14 or 13, and she actually uh, basically was able to overcome her feeling of being very hurt because her dad was disappointed that he had to go through the same ritual every year after Christmas, and it was kind of a childish thing, and so she was very hurt when she heard that, but she overcame that, and she didn't, uh, she didn't give in to her hurt feelings she said from that moment on, she continued to grow spiritually, so that was a big thing. She also had a vision of her dad. I don't remember when it was. It was, a, it was maybe 10 years before his illness. She had a vision of him in the garden with a veil covering his face. So she knew that there was tremendous suffering that was going to happen with her father. She didn't understand when that was going to happen. Uh, also, I think meeting the Pope, that was kind of extraordinary, you know, right? Actually going there and uh, petitioning him. You can't say anything to the Pope. You just kiss uh, his slipper and kiss his ring. And so she, uh, as, uh, as when in Italy do as the Italians do, so if they give you a rule, you don't have to follow the rule, right? So she begins to tell him everything that she wants to do. And uh, so that was pretty extraordinary. A couple of dreams she had as well. So there were those things. But also she had extraordinary sufferings too. When you think about it, her, her sufferings were extraordinary, both in her body and her soul as well. And her last years on earth were a continuous climbing up to Calvary. That was essentially what it was for her, not just physically, but also interiorly as well. She felt completely abandoned by God. She was going through the dark night of the soul as she was dying as well. It remains true, nevertheless, that the texture of her life, so in general, the texture of her life and her world uh, and even the cloister, it was woven by ordinary things, ordinary actions that are in the reach of all of us. So if we don't become saints, it won't be because we didn't have the opportunity. So we won't be able to stand before the Lord and say, well, you didn't give me the chance to become a saint. And he'll, say, he'll say, I give you all these ordinary opportunities. You just never saw them as opportunities to grow. So... The opportunities are always in front of us every moment of the day. The next topic here with simplicity is just the, the notion that Therese did grow in simplicity. She grew as she continued in religious life. In her autobiography, she says that at first she didn't understand, she did not understand the great value of simplicity. At first she didn't get that. It makes sense, right, uh, in the sense that we learn through experience and also God enlightens us progressively as we go along. He doesn't show us everything all at once uh, when we're little or at a certain time. He, progressively, he actually enlightens us. She wrote, Jesus doesn't like to show us everything all at once. He ordinarily gives light little by little. Why do you think, if I were to ask, why doesn't God show us everything all at once as far as the spiritual life or as far as what we have to do? Does anyone have any idea why doesn't God just come to us when we're, you know, we turn 15 or 16 and just say, okay, this is exactly what it's going to be like. This is what you have to do. Why do you think God doesn't do that to us? We have to walk in faith, right? Certainly we have to do that. Mm-hmm. Might become overwhelming, you just forget about it. Could be over, too much. I think that's what our Lord said to the apostles, right? He said, I have much to tell you, but you can't bear it all right now. That's one of the things he told them, right? I think the fear. fear as well? Yeah, that's possible. If you know what's coming, uh, I mean, uh, if you would have told me when I was 16 that I'd be a priest, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you're crazy, you are crazy. <laughs> Sure, exactly, exactly. I think it's all of that, you know, I really do. I think also part of the reason that he doesn't tell us everything all at once is because he does like to surprise us too, right? Believe it or not. Uh, those of you who are parents, uh, I think sometimes you enjoy surprising your children too. So uh, there is an element of surprise there that, they, that he likes to throw in as well. But I think it's all of those things, you know, it's all of those things really. Father Jamar says that simplicity holds the middle ground between two extremes. Father Roderick will like this. This will be a 
So the middle ground between the two extremes. What do you think the two extremes are? So if simplicity is in the middle, what do you think the two extremes would be between those? Any guesses? So one would be too far one way, the other one would be too far the other way. Okay, okay, okay. I think you're getting, you're getting close there. He would say, oh, it's kind of in a certain sense, he would say one rigidity on the one hand, and he would say laxity on the other hand. So what's the middle ground between rigidity and laxity? He would say simplicity. Okay, simplicity. Between destroying the flesh and catering to the flesh. You know, so you destroy it with rigidity, you cater to it with laxity. And the middle ground is simplicity. So if simplicity is the via media, right? So it's the middle way. So if that's the case, it really is a gift from God when you think about it. Because virtue is always in the middle. It's never on the extremes. Enlightened by the Holy Spirit, Therese changed her views regarding penance and mortification. Reading the lives of the saints, she was first inclined to imitate their example. You'll see this a lot with us young religious. Uh, we read a book on the lives of the saints, and we just start practicing whatever it is that the saint uh, did. The saint didn't eat anything for three days, so okay, I'm not going to eat anything for three days. They uh, slept on, uh, you don't even want to know what they slept on, and they, the, the friar or the brother, uh, maybe the sister as well. They say, okay, we're going to do that too. Very common among those who are young and zealous. Plus, a number of her religious sisters in the convent were devoted to the practice of extraordinary penances. So that was actually very common as well. So there was a certain peer pressure as well. If everyone's doing something extraordinary, then you kind of feel like you have to do the same thing as well to be at the same level of them. But Therese, actually, she fell ill because she wore a cross. I don't know, I think it was, maybe it was here on her chest. I'm not sure where she wore it. She wore an iron cross with uh, little uh, points on it, and she actually became ill because she did that. So she realized that the austerities of some of the saints weren't meant for her, and they weren't meant for those who walk in the little way of spiritual childhood. So this is how she realized that through experience. She couldn't handle it. So if her focus was not going to be on exterior extraordinary penances, if that was not going to be her focus, what would her focus turn to then? So she's not going to focus on uh, exterior extraordinary penances. What's she going to focus on instead? Interior, right? Interior mortification. Interior mortification of the mind, mortification of the heart. Those things became her focus. So she went to war against herself interiorly in the spiritual sphere by means of renunciation, by means of hidden sacrifices. Who can think of what an example might be with that? What are some kind of interior mortifications? What would she even be thinking about with that interiorly? So you remove your gallbladder or something, or no, is it, is you actually do something? No, what would she be thinking? Interior mortifications. Can anyone think of what would be an example of that? Yes. Like humbling yourself quietly. Okay, okay, yeah. Practicing you know, humility when you don't want to be humble. The Holy Spirit, I also always quote this one, right? The, the fruits of the Holy Spirit, one of them, St. Saint, Saint Paul says, is self-control, right? So being in control of myself when anger begins to well up in me, learning to be in control of that. Uh, there are some other examples here. We'll get to that in a second. When I was visiting the Visitation Sisters in Massachusetts, so the Visitation Sisters are the ones that were founded by uh, St. Francis, Jane Francis de Chantal, and also St. Francis de Sales, the Visitation Sisters. They have a convent in Massachusetts next to the Divine Mercy Shrine. I don't know, has anyone actually been to the Divine Mercy Shrine in Massachusetts, Stockbridge? Very beautiful, actually, Western Massachusetts. Um, so we were visiting there because we were helping out with the, with the, uh, with the Divine Mercy weekend. And uh, so the, the Visitation Sisters tend to have very nice things. The convent is very nice. You go in, it's very nicely decorated. They have 
uh, you know, fine uh, silverware. They've got all kinds of uh, very nice pictures and furniture and all those things. And we commented to one of the sisters who was serving us. We commented. We said, oh, you have really nice things here. This is a very nice, very nice convent here. And she said to us, she said, yes. Uh, she said, our Holy Father, meaning St. Francis de Sales, she said uh, he wanted our uh, the sisters to have nice things, uh, nice accommodations, but interiorly, she said he wanted us to be stripped bare. <laughs> he said, <laughs> interiorly, he said he wanted, she, he wanted us to be stripped bare, uh, meaning that the interior was to belong entirely to the Lord. So you can have things, exterior things that are nice, but they don't possess you interiorly. Interiorly, you're possessed by the Lord. That's how St. Therese began to understand penance and mortification. In, the spirit, in that spirit, instead of focusing again on the external penances, she practiced self-forgetfulness. She practiced avoiding seeking herself in what she was doing. So if, we were to, if I were to ask you, which is harder? Would it be harder to wear a small iron cross with nails on it, or would it be harder to detach yourself from your own will? <laughs> if you think about it. It's actually harder. The interior mortifications are a lot harder, right? Uh, or from your own wa way of wanting things. I'll detach myself from the way I want things to be done or arranged. Uh, yes? I just have a question about self-forgetfulness. Mm -hmm. um, if you're trying to like die of yourself and then people in public want to talk about, like ask you questions about yourself, how do you try to re like reduce yourself while trying to like Connect with the other person, I guess. Well, you could do, uh, you could say no comment if they ask uh, Lauren, <laughs> tell us something about it. You say no comment. Or you say, I take the fifth. I take the fifth, right? I don't say anything <laughs> that incriminates me. Oh, well, you have to be prudent about interactions with others. Uh, sometimes it can be good. It, we, I think part of it would be, you know, what it, is what I'm saying? Is it saying something so that I can build myself up in other people's eyes? Or is it saying something so I can edify others? Am I sharing something that can be helpful for them? Or am I sharing something so that people can say, wow, I didn't realize you had a Lamborghini. That's, that's amazing. You know? so, I think part of it is the intention, really, the intention of our hearts. So it, it, basically, in summary, I think it would be easier to wear the Iron Cross, honestly. Uh, the, some of the exterior penances are actually easier than the interior ones. And even with the exterior ones, you do get used to them over time. The interior ones, it's a constant battle, constant struggle. In a letter to Father, I'm gonna guess his name is pronounced Bellier, she wrote this, she wrote, I know that there are saints who spend their lives practicing extraordinary mortifications, but after all, there are many mansions in the house of our Heavenly Father, she said. Jesus has told us so that it, so that is why I fall the way he has traced out for me. In those extraordinary penances, she says, there easily creeps in that which is inspired by nature rather than by virtue. Whereas in the hidden struggle of interior renunciation, nature cannot get a hold on us and we can more easily attain humility and peace. So in the exterior, doing the exterior things, we can still interiorly be very proud. We can still... Uh, kind of a pat ourselves on the back for being able to do things that others can't do. And you can actually begin to also look down on others. Well, they can't, they don't measure up, right? They're not as good, as, they're not as pen, penitential as us. Uh, so it's not saying that all exterior mortification is bad. She's just saying, no, you have to be careful. Uh, what's more important is interiorly, you have to be practicing the virtues. You have to be renouncing yourself interiorly. Father Jamar says, we know that our saint here, when she's talking about mortification, that she's teaching sound doctrine. Are there not numbers of persons, he says, who imagine that they are mortified because they practice bodily penances, while they fail to renounce themselves in the ordinary things of daily life or in the life of a religious community? Such persons, he says, are often lacking in humility of mind and are unwilling to obey. They don't practice self-forgetfulness, nor do they practice charity towards their neighbor. But they seemingly try to lead a spiritual life. Some may even be religious for many years and yet never succeed 
in renouncing their self-love. And they may never be able to make a serious resolution of forgetting themselves once and for all, says Father Jamar. So we repeat again our Lord's words. He said, if anyone would follow after me, you have to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. So denying ourselves spiritually is key. It really is key to growing. Therese tells us that at the beginning of her religious life, wishing to mortify herself at meals, she would mingle bitter herbs with her foods that she had a particular liking for. So something, if she really liked it, she would put bitter herbs in it so she would, wouldn't like it so much. Or if she tried to think of, or she would try to think of things that would make her have a disgust for them while she was eating them. So she's really trying to mortify herself uh, a lot. Um, but later she said, I found that it was much more in conformity with the virtue of simplicity to offer them to the good Lord and thank him for the things which I found to my taste, to thank the Lord for the things that, that she enjoyed. She adds, however, but when something was lacking, so something at the table she didn't have, the salt, or there was something that was lacking, maybe the other sisters had eaten something else, a portion of the, the, another food that she wasn't able to get, when something was lacking, I was much more satisfied because I was then truly giving up something. So it's really a beautiful balance that she's able to find there between the extremes. Uh, so it's okay. This morning we had, uh, for breakfast, there were nice chocolate brownies out there and I thought of Father Roderick because he just came back and I thought how much he would appreciate those and so eating the chocolate brownies for him it was a great thing I'm sure uh, you can be you can eat the chocolate brownie and be happy at the same time you don't have to beat yourself up about that but don't eat too much don't eat too much uh, that's, we have to be careful Therese also rejected mortifications that might interfere with the intention she gave to God one day when someone spoke to her about a priest who suffered greatly from a skin irritation and he wouldn't, ref he wouldn't alleviate the pain, he wouldn't take anything from for the pain, he would just suffer it. She said this, she said, I would not be able to practice that sort of restraint. I prefer to practice mortification in a manner that leaves my mind more free for God, she says. So she would have taken the medication because then, at least interiorly, she could have been more focused on the Lord. That was her approach. Yes. You know, I have a problem with something. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think having effect fit fits in with this? Because a pet really takes your attention from God, doesn't it? What's that? A pet, a dog or a cat or something. I wondered about that. I, I think for some people it can, yeah. For some people it can. I know the sisters, I think it was uh, the missionaries of charity don't have pets for that reason, I think. Uh, they take their attention away from God. We have a cat, so uh, we have a cat so he can kill the mice. So that's helpful for us. So it's actually a practical reason. It depends on the person. You know, it really, what she's kind of getting at, a lot of it is the, the interior life is really what counts. You know, for some people, having a pet would be a big distraction and big, a big focus. Uh, for others, no. For some people, it's loneliness. That's why they have animals, right? Uh, and so to have a pet isn't necessarily a bad thing. You don't have to say, well, I don't have to have a pet uh, because I'm lonely. I just have the Lord. Uh, well, maybe one of the reasons he created pets was so that we wouldn't be so lonely sometimes, you know. I really think if you want a pet, I think they'd keep your friends. Sure. Oh, sure. Sure. I mean, it depends, you know, you want to treat them. With respect, and so yeah, it depends on how you how you look at it. For some people, it is kind of filling their lives with uh, kind of filling the hole in their lives that they don't have. Uh, instead of turning to the Lord, they kind of turn to pets or things or you know whatever. For others, it's that's not the problem. So I would say that's something to bring to spiritual direction. So talk to your spiritual director about having pets. So if that's okay or not. Mother Agnes, her sister Pauline shared Therese's approaches to sacrifices when she said this. Her approach to sacrifice was that the best rule is that we should follow what love inspires us to do from moment to moment with the sole desire of pleasing the good Lord in everything he, has, he asks of us. So the first thought is always, you know, I want to please the Lord in what I'm doing. So that should be the, the, the driving thought 
with what we're doing. I want to please the Lord. And then that'll dictate how we're to respond to everything at each moment. Nevertheless, while accepting Therese's rule of prudence, which takes into account our weakness and makes us practice a simplicity that favors little souls, nevertheless, we must avoid a softness that would go counter to the essential principles of the little way. So a lot of times our problem isn't that we're going to go too far in the, I'm going to just renounce everything. The problem is we're going to fall into the other extreme. The problem is always falling back into laxity and comfort. Discretion and simplicity must never lead us to spare our nature in a manner that would falsify the little way. So don't become lax and say, I'm just following the way of St. Therese. Please don't do that. Uh, that's, that's not really what she's teaching. It's not really what she's teaching. As Mother Agnes explains that the supernatural spirit, the love of Jesus must always remain the rule of our conduct. All of our conduct must be guided by that. And we know, I think, sometimes, for example, if uh, we need to recreate or we need to just wind down, I think we know the difference between when we need to rest and when we're just being lazy. Uh, I think if we're honest with ourselves, we know the difference between those two. At the beginning of our spiritual life, and even later, some people aren't drawn to mortifications or penances or don't have the courage to really practice those things the way they should be practiced. You know, even with our good dispositions, that's the case. Some people just aren't drawn to that. Father Jamar says, with a heart turned to God and docile to his inspirations, let us in all simplicity give to him what we're able to give. So we give to the Lord what we're able to give. That's what he asks of us. What's the example that I th thought of in the Gospels when I heard that? Well, the example would be the widow with the two mites, right? The widow who goes to the temple and has only two coins to offer, and she gives that to the temple. And uh, everyone uh, overlooks what she gave except Jesus, because Jesus say that, notice that she gave everything she had. So we give to the Lord what we have, and that's what he asks of us. If we're generous and faithful, and if God expects more from us, he'll give us the light and the strength necessary, necessary to accomplish more as far as penances go. So it's really about being guided by the Holy Spirit as far as uh, penances and mortifications. We need to be guided by the Spirit of the Lord in doing those things. The last thing, maybe the last thing, we'll mention is Therese's simplicity in illness when she was sick. So I have a question. Do people tend to be more virtuous or less virtuous when they're sick? Do they tend to be more virtuous or less virtuous? Those of you who know from experience, what would you say? You're more, well, that's great. Okay, I'll take care of you. If you, if you become sick, I will take care of you. That's impressive. That's impressive. Typically, when, uh, when the friars, when we have a headache or something, it's get out of our way. Uh, this is a don't bother him, he's sick. Uh, typically, a lot of people, when they're, when they're sick, they tend to, the virtue tends to be a little less uh, than normal. Uh, Self-focused, right? Focused on myself, right? Exactly. It often happens that even in religious communities, the sick consider themselves a burden to those who care for them. You know? And also a financial strain on the community. They yield to anxiety and fear that their illness might be prolonged. I'm guessing that's not just in religious communities that that happens, probably, right? Not just uh, sometimes that happens to everyone. Therese also experienced those kind of thoughts. She had those kind of thoughts and feelings, but when God established her in the practice of abandonment to his divine will, when she was firmly rooted in that, she understood that it was more simple to accept whatever God sent her. That was her approach. She said, I am willing to be ill all my life if that pleases the good Lord. She wrote, I even consent to live a very long life in this condition, in her illness. And she, regarding medication, she said this, I grieved much because I had to take medicine that was very expensive, but now that no longer bothers me. Quite the contrary, for I have read that those who are doing good to us benefit by their charity. So she knew that you know, if she has to take medicines because you're religious and that they're expensive medicines and people are paying for them, you say, well, people are paying for this, I don't want to do that. Well, uh, on the supernatural side, those people are your benefactors, and so God's going to reward them. God rewards those who take care of his children. So she knew that. She began to see that. 
And she said, well, okay. Uh, she would basically take enough medication that was necessary, but she wouldn't take excess. But that's how she saw it. Actually, our benefactors are actually being blessed because they're actually helping us. That became her focus. Okay, and we'll end with one thing here. Therese's simplicity and acceptance of joys. In the little way, one, again, only has God in view. God is the one who we are looking at when we're living the little way. All our actions are intended to give him pleasure. That's how St. Therese would put it. Whatever I do is intended to give Jesus pleasure. We must lose sight of ourselves and refuse to be attached to anything whatsoever. So again, that aspect of detachment. So I get detached from things, detached from even uh, what others think of me, detached from uh, you know, my own abilities, detached from uh, everything except the Lord. I get detached from the things of the earth and attached to the Lord. That's how detachment is supposed to work. Detached from my own will, even my own way of wanting things, my own understanding even of some things. It's part of what it means to be a Catholic too. So I don't have to understand and figure out everything and know everything. And uh, no, that's the whole point of there's authority over me. Uh, They're responsible. They're responsible. I don't have to figure out anything. Well, not anything, but I don't have to figure out everything. What do Protestants do? They don't like the pastor. Uh, they don't like the, the church. What do they do? Start your own church. <laughs> so they're literally what they do. They come, sometimes they even come here to the friary. I know there's someone who comes here to talk to us every now and then. And uh, he says, yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm looking to start my own church. You know, I'm going go to go to Bible school and start my own church. And I said, oh, that's good. I'm thinking to myself, that's not, that's not how the Lord wants us to do it, right? <laughs> yeah. You don't like the pastor, you start your own church. Uh, No, that's not how it works. It would seem to follow then that we wouldn't be free to enjoy legitimate pleasures if we always have to be detached from everything, right? So I can't enjoy anything. No, that's not what St. Therese would say. That's not her approach. Uh, that That wouldn't be consonant with her teaching, particularly with the practice of simplicity. Therese knew too well the heart of our Heavenly Father and the heart of Christ, who himself did not reject earthly pleasures. She never thought that God wants to draw us away from the few small joys we meet in this valley of tears. And this is what she says. The good Lord, who loves us so much, already suffers enough because he sees himself obliged to leave us on earth to go through our time of trial. And he must be glad when he sees a smile. She said, it seems that if we can say that our sacrifices are like locks of hair that captivate the heart of Christ, we must likewise say that our joys affect him in a like manner. In order that this may be so, it suffices that we refrain from indulging in a selfish sort of happiness and offer to our spouse the small joys he strews on the path of our life to delight our souls and raise them even to himself. So the only condition that St. Therese demands of us that when we accept, when we have joys in our life, is that we don't take selfish complacency in them and that we use them as a means to raise ourselves to God. As a way to thank the Lord, as a way to raise our minds to him. So the pleasing things in this life should become like a ladder that help us climb up to God. You know, you enjoy something, that's something that should actually raise your mind and your heart to the Lord, who is the source of all goodness. So all good things come from the source of all goodness. There's a famous painting of St. Francis that we probably mentioned before of that by Murillo. I think that's his name in Spain, in Spanish, uh, where St. Francis is stepping on the globe and he's reaching up to Jesus on the cross. And Jesus is actually detaching from the cross to reach down and embrace St. Francis, right? So Jesus is actually, basically his hand comes off the nail on the one side and he's reaching down to embrace St. Francis who's reaching up to embrace Christ. And uh, underneath, again, his foot is the globe. And I think that there are a couple of angels in the corner and they're holding uh, a book in Latin that basically says... uh, that uh, Francis was, it's a verse from scripture, I don't remember which one it was, but basically that uh, he uh, puts all things under his feet, he basically uh, all renounces the worldly 
possessions, worldly desires in order to attain Christ, right? Another way to look at that is, you know, the worldly, uh, the good things of this world are a way that we actually go up. We can actually use those things as a ladder to reach Christ. So it's not necessarily despising things. It can also be also enjoying some of the things that we have that actually are a ladder for us to reach up to Jesus. Both ways are, are legitimate. Both ways are legitimate. Therese herself accepted with simplicity whatever joys God sent her, whether they were occasioned by spiritual favors, by her family, or by contemplating nature. She accepted pleasures out of love, just like she accepted sufferings out of love. She accepted both of them out of love. She would have considered it a failure or a fault against simplicity if she had refused to enjoy the charms of nature or of music or of art or whatever moved her thoughts of love and gratitude towards God. And toward the end of her life, speaking about the joys of her heart, she explained that she had mistakenly deprived herself of them at the beginning of her religious life. So she, at the beginning of her religious life, she tried to mortify herself completely, no joys, no, no uh, enjoying anything as a way of dying to self. But she understood later on that that wasn't the way that dying to self that our Lord wanted from her. She no longer felt, as she grew in religious life, she no longer felt it necessary to refuse the joys of life that she experienced because her soul was strengthened by him who was truly her only love. And she said this. She said, I am glad to recognize that when we love God, our heart expands and we can give him incomparably more tender love to those we can give incomparably more tender love to those who are dear to us than when our love is selfish and barren so she realized that god's love actually is meant to and it did in her case especially it's meant to expand the heart not contract it meant to expand it so that we can actually love others with a pure love as well and she said love is fed by and develops from sacrifice the more we deprive ourselves of natural satisfaction, the stronger and more disinterested our love for others becomes. So in a word again, what is she saying? The more we say no to our selfishness, the more we say no to our self-centered ways of thinking and acting, the more we become freer in our love. The more our love becomes more profound, the more it becomes deeper, the more it becomes more expansive as well. And then the joys of this life really do help us climb up to the good Lord. We can appreciate the simple things, and they will bring us to the thought of how good God is. As St. James says, he says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. James 1, 17. So we learn not to despise the good things, but we also learn to not indulge in them selfishly. We learn to appreciate them and offer them back to the Lord. Are there any questions that we have from what we've learned today? Anyone want to offer any questions? Or There are a couple of other sections in the notes. For those of you who are new today, we do have some notes. So I do have notes printed out of the conferences. So the notes that are here on the chair are from yesterday's conference and today's conference. So it's basically been two conferences on the topic of simplicity. So you're welcome to take those Notes, there are a couple of sections that we left out uh, toward the end, but you're welcome to read those on your own. So we'll finish with a prayer. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. St. Therese, pray for us.